the end time in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 19 through verse 24. <clears throat> Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves praises in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is not sound, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We've indicated that the central theme of Matthew chapter 6 concerns our relationship to God. Jesus is teaching us about relating to the Father. There are some things that can destroy that relationship, even as there are things that can build the relationship. Jesus is really speaking to us about the things which destroy our relationship in order to provide sufficient guarding so that the relationship with the Father might be well. In verses 1 through 18 of chapter 6, Jesus indicated that one thing which destroys our relationship to the Father is an external performance of a relationship when the heart and the interior and the personalness of that relationship is not existing. An external giving, an external praying, an external fasting a marks of a bankruptcy of the inner spirit, which means the relationship is not existing viably. In verses 19 through 24, Jesus indicates that the relationship with the Father can be broken through competition for our love and for our interest, the love of the world or the love for the world. This love for the world is different, of course, than the love which is spoken of in John 3, 16. God so loved the world, God loved the people in the world, the love of which Jesus is speaking of in chapter 6, which can destroy a relationship with him, is a competing love which, for the world which may be characterized in the form of worldliness. John so beautifully defines what worldliness is in 1 John 2.16 by saying that all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. In other words, coveting those things which have attraction for the physical senses, to value those as preeminent, to love those more than that which is unseen, God, his kingdom, his work, person, to act with pride in a worldly sense as if one were the owner and the giver of his own life, to act idolatrously by striving to pile up the praises which can be either things or they can be ideas and values which become substitutes for God. All of these are manifestations of love for the world. And the cares of the world is the theme which is addressed by Jesus in verses 25 through 34, where we'll look at next week to see how anxiety can also destroy our trusting relationship with the Father. Jesus, who is always on target, whether he is describing our relationship with God or our relationship with other people, I think provides us some insight into how not only relationship with God may be broken, but how relationships between people are broken, even how relationships within a family may be broken. A family, for example, let's take a man and a wife, which many of you are here today or in that situation. What if in that relationship you are only going through the external externalities of the relationship? Uh, in public, and you put on a kind of a, a good tone to your marriage, no one would suspect that the, in the internal life there is not a correspondence with the external image which you present. Thus, when one begins to use a relationship simply to keep up outward experiences to cover and camouflage an inward deficiency, real danger ensues. The relationship is being tested and is moving toward being broken. Or when in a relationship with another human being, such as in a marriage commitment, there is a demoting of the other person to second place for the sake of someone else or something else. This is a moving towards a false love, which is the kind of love Jesus speaks about when we move away from love of the Father, love for the world, it's substituting a love. And when we make substitutions, 
then inevitably anxieties are produced by those substitutions so that there is a further deterioration of the relationship. Jesus is concerned about our relationship with the Father and particularly in the subject for this week how it is that we can develop the right priorities, the right love. There are really four key words to the paragraph which we have read, uh, the word uh, heart, the word treasure, the word I, and the word master. And we look at each of these in turn. Where is your heart? We uh, can think of the heart as something which is solely physical, the pump in our body, the muscle. Uh, It's hard for me to think of my heart as a a muscle or a pump because it's so much a part of me, I couldn't get along without it. But it's there, it's pumping away. Yet, uh, in the scriptures, when the word heart is used, it is used only a minority of times to refer to the heart as a physical organ. Most of the time, heart is used in the scripture, it is used to speak of the real self, the real me, or the real you. We sometimes use the word heart to speak of a person's emotions. He has real heart, or have you got a heart for this? And involved in the real you is the emotional level. But in the biblical use of the word heart, the word emotion describes but one facet of the real you. For it is with heart, and with mind, and with will. All of these are part of the essential being that is you. Therefore, when Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He's not only speaking of your emotions, how you feel toward your values. He's not only speaking of your mind, how you're thinking toward them, and of your will, how you're acting upon what you're feeling and thinking. He's speaking all three of these things together. To emphasize how the heart really is the real you, we use terms, adjectives that are associated with the word heart to describe our behavior or the behavior of others. Good-hearted, glad-hearted, merry-hearted, stout-hearted, brave-hearted, (laughs) Chicken-hearted. <laughs> when we say chicken-hearted to somebody, we don't mean he's just chicken in his emotions. We mean he's chicken all over, because his real essence is to be a chicken. Faint-hearted, soft-hearted, kind-hearted, stubborn-hearted, hard-hearted, cold-hearted, wicked-hearted, tired heart, true-hearted, heavy-hearted, tender-hearted. Which words would you apply to your own heart? The real you. Jesus indicates where our treasure is, there our heart is. And we find from Scripture that it is with the heart that we believe, or it is with the heart that we disbelieve. When Paul writes to the Romans, he says that if we believe in our heart that Jesus has been risen from the dead, we'll be saved. It's not simply an intellectual belief, it's the real you that becomes committed to the resurrection of Jesus. On the other hand, the New Testament grapples with the question of why is it that some do not believe in Jesus Christ? And it revolves finally down to the basic essential element that they have not believed with our heart. There's an incredible story in the Gospel of Matthew which I saw last Easter for the first time. I couldn't believe that something so basic could escape me for so long. And I shared it with you at that time, but it was simply this. But in Matthew chapter 28, when we find that the, uh, uh, pris- uh, the guard to the empty tomb bring the word to the, those who have been responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus, those who have been responsible for that crucifixion knew in their heads, intellectually, that something had happened other than that the disciples had stolen the body. Intellectually, they could realize that there couldn't have been an earthquake or there couldn't have been that exit of Jesus from the tomb except that it had been by divine resurrection. They knew it intellectually. But earlier in Jesus' ministry, Jesus had flatly told them, you worship me with your lips, but in your heart you are far off from God. You do not worship God from your heart. And because in the heart, where the real you is, there was a disbelief in the resurrection. Not because there wasn't sufficient data, not because the facts didn't compel belief, but because there was a stubborn refusal. Paul thus is able to write that the God of this world has blinded the hearts of those who disbelieve. Why? Because in the inner self, there's the determination that I will make it my way. And if the gospel of Christ is refused, it's because in the real inward self, We've never come to that belief in him. A right heart, though, when we come to Christ, we find is not a work, but a gift. A right heart to believe, to have faith, a right heart to please God, is not something that we wake up one morning and pinch ourselves real hard and say, I'm going to have a right heart from now on. I'm going to have the right priority. I'm going to have God at the center of my life. It involves that, but it involves something more than that. For we learn in the scriptures that a right heart and a new heart is in itself a gift from God. 
Ezekiel very clearly prophesying not only I think as a future Israel but prophesying of Christ's work in our life says a new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. It is as if when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ when we come to God for faith in Him we receive a gift. Imagine it if you will beautifully packaged in with a ribbon. Our works come in when we go to untie the ribbon and open and see what's in the package and begin appropriating it. But the gift has been given. When you came to Jesus Christ in conversion, he gave you a new heart. And I would simply say, have you opened the treasure of himself which he gave you so that you are living out of what is inside the package? So that you're living out of what is inside Jesus Christ. For already in seed form, in gift form, he has presented himself to you so that you can have the right heart. It's impossible to, do, to make it on your own. The gift must be first from Christ and then the appropriation we and his spirit make. God is at work in us and we are at work as well. The heart, the real you, determines what your priorities are. Or your priorities determine what your real self is like. Thus Jesus talks about treasure. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be. I ran across the story of a farmer who one day went home happily with great joy to report to his wife and family that their best cow had given birth to twin calves, one red and one white. And the farmer said to his wife, You know, I suddenly had a feeling and an impulse that we must dedicate one of these calves to the Lord. We'll bring them up together, and when the time comes, we'll sell one and keep uh, the proceeds for ourselves, and then we'll sell the other one and give the proceeds to the Lord's work. His wife asked him which calf he was going to dedicate to the Lord. And uh, he said, well, there's no need to bother about that now. We'll treat them both the same way. And when the time comes, we'll do as I say. And off he went. In a few months, the man returned to his kitchen one day looking very miserable and unhappy. When his wife asked him what was troubling him, he said, I've got bad news for you. The Lord's calf is dead. <laughs> but, she said, you had not decided which one was going to be the Lord's calf. Oh, yes, he said, I know that, but I had always decided that it was going to be the white one, and the white one has died. The Lord's calf is dead. <laughs> this a little way of getting into where your treasure is. <laughs> Jesus indicates that there are two places our treasure can be. Our treasure is the thing which we value the most. The thing which is high in our list of priorities. Jesus indicates our treasure can be on earth or it can be in heaven. How do you get a hold of that? How do you define it? How do we say living in Costa Mesa or Newport or this area in 1975, how do we talk about treasure? It's not something that's buried in a, in a, um, uh, a box in a field that we dig up. What is treasure? It seemed to me that treasure on earth involves deriving our main or total even satisfaction from things that are this world only. Things that are only good for this age, for the now. Uh, and if we derive our main or total satisfaction, our values are chiefly centered upon those things which are of this earth, then we have treasure on earth. There are lots of treasures, lots of possibilities. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is really just groping with two treasures. One is the treasure related to recognition, which is not a material thing at all. It's in the earlier part of chapter 6. The treasure of the religious hypocrites was recognition. That was what they valued. It's what their whole life was invested in, what their whole social system was beating towards, why they tortured themselves the way they did, so that they could be recognized, because in recognition there was their treasure. This is a frequent and temptation and subtle sin of those who are involved in, quote, spiritual ministries or, quote, spiritual roles, uh, that the treasure may not be material, but the treasure instead becomes pride and recognition. And, and one has to be aware that this indeed can be a treasure on earth, acting to be well thought of. Uh, material things can also be a treasure, as Jesus indicates. And Jesus groups all material things into one of two categories. He indicates that they are subject either to deterioration or to theft. Deterioration is in the form of, uh, if it's cloth, moth, and if it's metal, rust. That's deterioration. And theft, or the abrupt taking away from. Now, <clears throat> there's a great deal of, uh, of wisdom to this, obviously. The things material do disappear from us in one of these two ways. 
Uh, we all, for example, are going to look differently a few years from now if we live than when we look now. And I could dare say that some of you look differently now than you did a few years ago. I suspect uh, that some of you gals who are young in here, just to pick on the gals for a few moments, are going to know what the deterioration process is uh, in about ten years when you're my age. <laughs> Funny how we fight the deterioration process. Every once in a while, a person in the, in the middle age will have this uh, incredible thing of trying to all of a sudden be young again. So that a person's uh, 45 to 50 and is trying to act like he or she is 20, look like he or she is 20, uh, all of a sudden the uh, more modest car gets put away for something real zippy and racy. I had a seminary prophet did this one time. It was really sharp to watch this in his life. And no judgmental, but just kind of a thing. We, we, like, to, uh, we like to try to back off from that, uh, from that process of deterioration. But uh, friends, you know, it's probably going to happen the, uh, there are not too many of you uh, that are wearing clothes that you wore ten years ago that still fit. <laughs> no, mine don't. <laughs> and I wore them out anyway. Uh, we just keep having to change uh, the principle of moth deterioration. It's very fascinating when we look at the, even the body as subject to deterioration or theft that we can apply those same principles. Uh, if the Lord does not return for us and we meet Him in the air, we're going to face the exit of this world of death. We will meet that exit in one of two ways, through deterioration or through theft. Through the process of aging, there will come a time when our body will break down and we will die. That's deterioration. Or it may be that at a very un, what's called an untimely age, when a person is a young or a child, there is a loss of life. What's that? That's not deterioration, it's theft. It's an abrupt severance of something which seems rightfully to belong to us. But things, whether they're related to the body, whether they're, the, uh, whether they're related to material things, uh, subject to uh, change and decay. All around, one hymn writer wrote, uh, he saw change and decay, but he saw God as without change or without decay. So Jesus says, be reasonably aware of this. Get it, in, get it into the forefront and even into the subconscious part of your mind that the things which are of this earth have got to go one of those, through one of those two processes. One of the things we'll talk about in the sermon tonight is the attempt on our part to deny death, to deny the reality of things because they are too difficult for us to face up to and to meet square eye to eye. But Jesus was never faced to square us up with things as they really are. He says, don't get all caught in the trap of having your values in things that are deteriorating or subject to theft. Instead, have your values in heaven where there is no deterioration and where there is no theft. What does it mean to have values in heaven? It means, of course, to have one satisfaction in this life and the things which belong to heaven, which can last longer than the lifespan which we have. I have to ask myself, what are some of the things that I can take to heaven? What are some of the treasures that I can lay up? I think if I understand the commandment, second commandment rightly, love your neighbor as yourself, that one of the things I can take to heaven is myself. I don't want to take a person to heaven that I'm fighting with. I don't want to take a person to heaven that I don't like. I don't want to take a person to heaven that I feel inferior with and wish I weren't. I don't want to take a person to heaven that I just wish God hadn't made my face this way or given me the freckles uh, that I have or the bald head that I have. You know, I kind of want to get used to myself because uh, I hope, you know, to be, well, I'm going to be in heaven. You know, I'm not, I know I'm not going to take myself, Jesus is going to take me, but in a way that's one of the treasures I have that I'm going to meet myself over there. So there's some proper emphasis upon the self. I'd like to see heaven as an extension, uh, on some, in some ways, as an extension of uh, the God-given interests and talents and abilities and character that through Christ He's placed in my life here. So I'd like to make an investment in being a worthy servant of the Lord in heaven. And I'd like to start making the investment and putting out down the layaway plan now. And again, I'm not equating salvation at all to something that we do on our own work, but just to say, I, I think there is some investment that I must make in my own life in respect to having a value there. How I guard my time, how I guard my interests, how I guard my associations, how I guard my attitudes. But also my values are to be in the family, for I hope, as the words of the old gospel song goes, we haven't sung it of late, and I don't think it's in our hymnal anymore, 
But it's a beautiful title. I wish I knew the words. Will the circle be unbroken? I can remember when I was younger standing around in a church service and all the families would be asked to kind of stand in a, in a circle together and hold hands. And they'd sing that song, Will the circle be unbroken? Because there was a desire that in eternity we would all be together. That we would have that kind of an influence upon one another. I have a grandfather that I, that I never met. But in the early part of this century, he made choices that determined to lay up treasures in heaven rather than on earth. And because of the choices he made, it initiated a whole series of events which are still paying dividends with the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. He laid up treasure. I recognize this more and more. And I think we lay up treasure in terms of our relationships with others. Isn't it interesting? We really lay up treasures in relationships. Relationships with God, relationship with ourselves, relationship with others. How I, I got to thinking of how a woman directly laid up a treasure in heaven in responding to Jesus. Really, I never saw this until I was really thinking about this yesterday and it struck me that this woman laid up treasure. Do you recall that uh, the Saturday before Jesus' death, he was in a home of Simon and a woman came to him. We know from one of the Gospels her name to be Mary. She broke an alabaster uh, jar over him and poured out precious perfume, ointment upon him. The aroma filled the house. The ointment was evaluated at what I would calculate to be 300 working days wages, which given our particular economy today would amount to quite a hunk of money. And she, it was a kind of probably a family treasure, a family heirloom. And, and as a treasure on earth, it could have been located um, all during the time Jesus was in the house. It could have stayed on the shelf. But she wanted to do something for Jesus because she, perhaps alone, of all the people, recognized truly the Lord meant it when He said He was going to die. She wasn't denying His death like everyone else. She was prepared to accept the Lord's death. So she was the only one on earth that would agree with Him that He was going to die. Kind of an interesting thing. So she poured it over Him. Now, if you'll allow me to imagine a minute, and forgive me if you, you, know, if you feel I'm taking liberties, but I'm going to take liberties. Just picture the moment that that Mary went to be with the Lord in heaven. The Lord has already ascended to heaven. Now she, through death, is with the Lord. Now, I, I can't describe you know, how it is that spirit can embrace spirit or how the physical body, the resurrected body, relates to the spirit and all this, but let's just think of it in human terms. I think Jesus walked right over to her and just hugged her. And I kind of think that one of her treasures in heaven that will never be forgotten under the ages is the beautiful thing she did for him. He is always going to remember that wonderful thing which she did. She alone tuned in to his, to his feeling. She alone tuned in to his approaching death and she did something about it. And the memory will never leave the Lord. And he intended, in fact, that it never leave the church. That's why he said, wherever the gospel goes, this story will be told as a memory of this woman. She poured out a treasure which still lasts on earth. Now, the alabaster is gone a long, long, long time ago, but the memory has never gone. And we, isn't it fantastic to, to realize that we can do this for others, that we can even do direct things for the Lord. And I, I, that's why I guess I get so caught up with what happened last Sunday morning at the close of the service here when, it, when the Lord, I felt really gave to me a theme for the missions convention. Let's throw the heart of Jesus. I tell you, when, when I stand before the Lord, I just like for Him, I always say, well done, thou good and beloved, saying it from a distance. You know, I'd like Him to walk over, put His arm around me and just grab me real tight and say, hey, you did a good job. <laughs> really, you know, remember that time? That really blessed my heart. You really came through. And, and then he's going to say, but you realize that uh, it was me that was helping you all along. <laughs> <laughs> we give uh, treasures in heaven indirectly as well. There are people um, who are blessed by our act of giving and our values that, whom we never even see. I think of this in respect to a letter they came to me this week from uh, John and Audrey Maddox, who, uh, Renee, is Renee here today? Where's Renee? There you are. Her mom and dad are in Ivory Coast. Uh, West Africa, right? I always get it confused, but it is West Africa. And they, I've just got to read this story. It's so good. Because it, it, as I read it, I was getting ready to drop it in the Maddox file. I have all the missionaries' files right in the drawer next to me so I can kind of keep aware of what they're doing. And I got ready to drop this in the file. I thought, no, this Told, tells me that it's of more value right now than the file because it demonstrates how I help indirectly lay up treasure in heaven. So I'll read the story. It begins with a quotation. 
And you help lay up this treasure too. Your food is good, but it is hot with peppers, end quote. Explained the missionary 95 years ago in Maine Burby. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm struggling. M-A-N-E-B-E-R-E-B-Y. Maine Burby, I'll call it. In anger, his host demanded, Are you saying my wife can't cook? From that time, it was decided that the missionary must be killed. We don't know the denomination or nationality of the missionary. We think he might have been English and that a ship probably let him off at the village. The villagers tell us a captain on ship was watching the shore with his binoculars and saw them killing the missionary and sent his men to shore to arrest the murderer. The story is told that the villagers took the missionary and put him in a canoe. They rowed the canoe to another part of the shore where there were rocks. The missionary opened his Bible. He told them he had come to teach them God's word. And if they killed him because God had led him there, their village would have much trouble. Then his life was taken from him. They left the missionary and his dog, which was killed also on the rocks without burial. Somehow a rock formation formed around the body of the man and his dog, looking just like their bodies lying there. And although the rocks were worn from these 95 years of weather, the forms are still there with a constant reminder to each generation. The Maddoxes go on to relate how they made a visit to this uh, tribe and, and the tribe really was concerned about the curse. They told about the misery that had come upon the tribe in those intervening 95 years. And they asked the Maddoxes to return to the tribe and to lift the curse. So John and Audrey Maddox writes, Audrey writes a letter, Sunday morning, the 3rd of August, we put our filtered water in the car and started to Maine Barabee, wondering what the day held for us. The missionary has a variety of experiences and this village was different. The people had built the promised bridge so we didn't have to walk too far. They promised it was a little difficult for the car to get in there. Our Christians from other areas were there ahead of us and had the brush arbor ready for the service. The fetishers had become upset about our entering the village and were having a service in an adobe building just across from our brush arbor. When we started singing, they came out of their building and danced to our music. They had planned to attend our service, but as John preached, they kept, hadn't planned to attend, but as John preached, they kept coming closer until we had almost everyone. People came forward and gave their lives to God. Four fetish ladies tried to come, but the fetish priest would not let them enter the brush arbor. They were held back by force. After the service, the villagers again called a meeting with us. They asked John if he understood the history of the missionary, and again it was told. Then we went out to the rock mounds. The villagers made a circle around the graves. As the drum beat, the people sang songs in their dialect about God. Again, John repeated the history of this missionary, read the Bible, preached, and then asked everyone to bow their heads. We had prayed much for this service. We didn't want it to be just an empty form or ritual. These people needed to feel the presence of God and understand His power. There was complete silence. Then in a flash, as though they had been directed and came in on cue, the whole group started weeping and praying. The presence of God permeated the whole atmosphere. No one could have gone away that day without a touch of God on his life. The people almost ran back to their village and when we left, they were still marching around the huts, beating their drums and singing about God. Praise God. That was an indirect treasure that we let up through assisting a person to get there. He had the direct benefit of the treasure. We had the indirect. It's part of our value. What we invest in. This ancient legend, I believe it's found in an apocryphal gospel, is told of Thomas. Make clear it is a legend, but I'm telling it because it's kind of an ancient story. But the Lord uh, was seen as appearing to St. Thomas and told him, The king of the Indies, John Doforus, seeks for an architect who will build him a palace finer than that of the emperor of Rome. I will send you to him, Jesus said. So Thomas went. The king gave him much gold and silver to build a palace and then went into a distant country where he remained for two years. Thomas did not build the palace, but gave all the treasures away to the sick and poor. Sounds like St. Francis of Assisi. When Gondoforus returned, he was so angry that he ordered Thomas to be thrown into prison. Then the brother of the king died. The king resolved to build him a magnificent tomb, but his dead brother, after he had been dead four days, rose and sat upright and told the king, The man you would torture is a servant of God. I have been in paradise and have seen a wondrous palace. The angel said that this is the palace Thomas has built for you. The king immediately went into the prison to free the apostles. Then Thomas said to him, do you not know that those who would possess heavenly things have little care for the things of this earth? Your riches can prepare the way for you to heaven, but they cannot follow you there. I know of people within this own congregation whose uh, sacrifice and laying up treasure in heaven has made it possible that us, including myself, some of us, can even worship here. I think if Sister Chronic wouldn't mind me mentioning it, of Pastor Chronic, who really in laboring to, to build this church, uh, really work himself into a stroke and is suffering with the physical effects of that today and we are reaping that man's effort
to lay up treasure which is in heaven. And it concerns me that we who come into a new generation in the church be conscious of the fact that if we want to provide for others, there are costs and there are commitments for us as well to lay up treasure in heaven so that other people can be blessed as a result of the fruit of our ministry. I think there will come a day when God will just even everything up. We don't always see it on this side. Jesus talks to us about our heart. He talks to us about our treasure, our values. He talks to us about what we're looking at, about the light that we're walking in. He says that our eye is the lamp of our body, and if we're not seeing rightly, then our body is going to be full of darkness. But if we're seeing with an eye that is sound, then our whole body is going to be full of light. Here he's talking about our perspective. The treasure that we're looking at, if the treasure that we're looking at is heavenly, then our body will be full of light. If we are, if we are torn between heaven and earth, if, or if we are simply centered on the things which are earthly, then the body becomes full of darkness. Isaiah really lays this theme down in chapter 50, verses 10 and 11, where he talks about persons who walk in two kinds of light. He says in verse 11 to those who are walking in their own light, And therefore their body is full of darkness. Behold, he says, all of you who kindle a fire and who set brands alight, walk by the light of your fire and by the brands which you have kindled, this you shall have from my hand, you shall lie down in torment. Dick Russell has a minister from San Diego. I heard him share about this just a week ago. It's so fascinating about this. He says, Isaiah is talking about persons who decided to do it their own way rather than God's way. And so they light a firebrand and walk in the light of their own life. For example... Adolf Hitler lit a firebrand. It was a firebrand of racial supremacy. It was a firebrand of war. It was a firebrand of the Wehrmacht. He walked in that light, and he thought he was doing what was right. But ultimately, it was shown that the light in which he walked, because it was his own light, was darkness, not the light. In the recent political history of our nation with Watergate, without attempting to take political sides, but simply to note that men highly placed in this country, including the president himself, lit a light of situational ethics, of morality, of cover-up, and of lying, and walked in that light, believing it to be right. And the light in which they were walking, when everything came out, turned to be darkness. David had this experience in the Bible. He lit a firebrand for himself. He believed that it was all right for him to commit adultery with Bathsheba, to kill Bathsheba's husband, but the light which he lit was darkness. Charles Manson, Lynette Palm, that group, lit a firebrand, believing they were walking in their own light, that they had the light, but the light in which they walked was dark. A person who does not come to this church at all, but just one time in a counseling situation some time ago, beautiful young girl who had, been, who had gone through separation marriage and who at that particular moment had had an affair which she felt was just wonderful and liberating. And I just have to say, as I review that experience, here is a person who lit a light, and who is walking in that light, believing it to be right, and ultimately it will be seen that the light in which that individual is walking is darkness. Very fascinating what Isaiah says in chapter 50, verse 10, about the righteous. He said, Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Who among you fears the Lord, and who among you walks in darkness and has no light, yet trusts the name of our Lord and relies upon his God. What's he saying? There are two responses to darkness. The person who believes in God doesn't light anything, for his light is the word of God, which guides him, if he is going through darkness, it guides him through the darkness. He doesn't need to light his own way. He depends upon the word of God. Not a physical light, but a spiritual light. But the person who is walking without God lights his own fire. Are you, as a person, have you ever struggled with this thing of someone who is doing wrong is clearly prospering, and you who are doing right are clearly, from an earthly sense, not prospering? This is the kind of thing Jesus is talking about, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you walk in the earth, if you light your own firebrand, for a while it seems right. There comes a moment when, like all of those who have walked in their own light, the light is put out and it is seen that it was darkness all along. Jesus wants us to have a right perspective, a right outlook on life. He wants our eye to be full of things that are good. If you look prospectively at life, your outlook sour or bitter or jealous or full of hurt, 
Jesus wants your whole body to be full of light, not these things. Jesus not only speaks of our perspective, but of what we are serving, who's controlling us, God or mammon. Mammon is a Hebrew word for material possessions that originally meant to entrust something to somebody, such as when you gave money to a banker, you entrusted it with him. However, it underwent a change in meaning, so that gradually it came to mean that in which a person puts his trust. How fallacious that our currency in coinage should reflect the term in God we trust, when in fact that seems so far from the truth. If someone is quipped in God we trust, all others they can. <clears throat> Jesus uses the term mammon to speak of those things which are subject to deterioration and theft in which we place our trust rather than God. And he says to us, we can't serve both, we must love the one and hate the other. I think we should understand the meaning of that word hate, by the way. Jesus does not speak against material possessions. What he is guiding us is the proper use of material possessions. At one point in his ministry, Jesus says, if anyone come after me, let him hate his father and mother. And what he did not mean by that is get mad at mom and dad, start grimacing at them, gritting your teeth, slapping them, hating them. No, that's not the kind of hate. It was a, a word, a strong word, which we must understand in a spiritual sense, meaning to devalue. That is to put in second place that the primary love is the love for God and it extends even in relationship to our family that God is first. So therefore, the hating of mammon is making it subservient to God. Jesus is plainly telling us that if we are trying to serve both at the same time, we're going to be pulled and we cannot possibly do it. There's a story that J.B. Phillips tells which is instructive in this whole matter of treasure and perspective and laying up treasures on heaven in heaven rather than on earth. He writes, Every year in the harvest fields of England there are thousands of little tragedies. The victims are those charming, they may not be charming to you, those charming little creatures, the field mice. Earlier in the year, the growing corn seems to them to be the ideal place in which to settle and bring up a family. Food, shelter, and building material are there in plenty, and everything seems perfectly adapted for their needs. The forest of innumerable corn stalks is their whole world, and in it they court and play, mate, and bring up their families. Their happiness seems to be complete until the harvest. For when the day comes for the owner of the field to reap the harvest, tragedy inevitable begins for the harvest mouth. The whole world of waving corn, which seems so snug and secure, so specially designed for his comfort and nourishment, comes crashing about his ears. The field which he thought was his world never really belonged to him at all. And the fact that the growing corn was not meant for his food and shelter has, alas, not entered his tiny head. The life of the harvest mouse is not a bad picture of the way in which we sometimes live in this world. We too work and play, court and get married or bring up children in the happy belief that it is our world and that to believe in an eventual harvest is old-fashioned and silly. Yet our Lord, who claimed to be the Son of God, said quite plainly that this world is like a field that belongs to God and that it is moving inevitably toward a harvest. This little world is not, as we might imagine, a permanent thing at all. When God decides that his great plan is consummated, he will reap the harvest. The field mouse is deceived because for months he is left to his own devices. He never sees the owner of the field and naturally knows nothing of the approaching harvest. It is possible that we may allow ourselves to be deceived because God, the owner of this world, does not put in an appearance. And for the purpose of the experiment we call life, he does not interfere with our power to choose. We may imagine that the field belongs to man and that there is no such thing as the eventual harvest. But if Christ really was as he claimed to be, God, then his statements about this world being an experimental field with an inevitable harvest should surely be most seriously considered no one can blame the little harvest mouse for not realizing the true purpose of the cornfield or the certainty of the eventual reaping. But what are we, mice or people? To the young in our midst, Jesus would say, what is your treasure? Where is your heart? What is your outlook? Who are you serving? To those who are at the middle station or beyond or coming to in life, Jesus is saying, as you evaluate where you've been and as you evaluate where you intend to go, what is your treasure at this point in your life? Where is your heart? 
What is your outlook? Who are you really serving? And to those who are older in our midst, I pray to see that the gospel always sees us as having yet opportunity to make decisions. Start anew. As you look at your life, what is your treasure at this moment? What is your heart? What is your outlook? Who are you serving? For this gospel passage never has any meaning if we simply leave it as a Bible study. It only has meaning for us if we personally answer the questions which are asked. Let us pray.